Welcome to Diffusing Congruence. Hey, welcome back, Sucky. How are you doing? <laughs> my my voice just caught in my throat, so I'm glad you you like caught the ball. <laughs> well, that's how we that, that's how we do it. We just kind of read each other's thoughts and minds, right? That's, that's where we've gotten after five years. Uh, it's it's yeah. it's true. Yeah. Uh, I was gonna say it's like a long running marriage, and I should say today is my anniversary to my real wife, <laughs> as opposed to my work wife, Curvez. <laughs> Well, happy anniversary, um, and I'm not the slight bit jealous. <laughs> How many years has it been? 16. 16. My wife said, sweet 16. I was like, I don't think that's a thing when it, in, in anniversary years. I was like, I that's think. right. That's right. I, I don't know if there's a medal or a, um, yeah, something, but the, you, you deserve something. Well, well I, she, actually, she you know des- what? Wait, she let, deserves something. Let me rephrase that. Exactly. Yeah, uh, she, yeah. she is a, a soldier. She is. <laughs> She is tremendous. Uh, I am Zaki Hassan. That is Pervez Ahmed. We are here celebrating the American Muslim experience. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And we are very excited to welcome our guest for this episode, uh, Asma T. Uddin, who is uh, a graduate from the University of Chicago Law School. She served as counsel for the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty and director of strategy for the Center for Islam and Religious Freedom in Washington. She's an expert advisor on religious liberty to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, senior scholar at the Museum's Religious Freedom Center, a visiting scholar at Brigham Young University Law School, and a non-residential fellow at UCLA and Georgetown University. She's also a term member with the Council on Foreign Relations and an adjunct law professor at George Mason University Law School. And she is here. That was a lot. She's here today to talk about her new book, When Islam is Not a Religion. Uh, Asma, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. Well, thank you for having me, and happy anniversary. Thank you so much. And and you've you've met my wife. You you've uh, you had you had the pleasure. Yes, I I remember coming to your place. Um, I think at the time you had four boys. I don't know if you've had more since then. That that um, that was that. Uh, yes, so that was one child ago because we have a little girl now. Oh, they fi- congratulations. They finally Thanks got so it right. Yeah, yeah. No, we're done now. That's it. <laughs> they finally got it right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and actually, you know, uh, Asma is here, but here uh, in spirit, and but not, unfortunately, in presence. She is actually joining us from Washington. Are you in Washington right now? So right now I'm traveling. I am in Miami. I was here for a couple of book events. Oh, it must in be. In Miami, actually, where I grew up, so... It's good to be back here. You, oh, that's right. You, you are you. You hail from Florida. Yep, born born and raised in Miami. Oh, got it. Yeah, and you know, I think it's probably a good place as any to start. And we definitely want to get to your book. I mean, I'm I'm super excited. I I, I delved into it. I, I had the I had the. Uh, um, the pleasure of reading the book, or at least getting through most of it, unfortunately. Um, but um, I wasn't able to f- complete all of it, uh, work calling and so on. But uh, as, a, as an attorney, I'm super excited about getting into some of the subject matter you cover in the book. But as we often like to do on the show here, you know, kind of start off with your origin story. Um, you already teased this a little bit, um, born and raised in Florida, um, you know, and then kind of maybe if you want to talk a little bit about your background, um, you know, growing up, and then of course, uh, your, your, uh, um, your, your legal career. Sure. So, um, as I noted, born and raised in Miami, my father had uh, gone to grad school at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh in the 1960s. And so when he was done uh, with his graduate work in civil engineering, he's like, well, you know, where do I settle? And uh, he looked to South Florida because at the time it was undeveloped. Um, And interestingly, having traveled back to Miami since I moved away uh, in 2000 and I guess it was not 2006 actually is when I first, so I left for law school, came back and then um, left after that for a number of other cities for work and for marriage. Um, But kind of coming back to Miami in that interim pretty regularly as I have many, a lot of family here, um, just seeing the level of development. I mean, it's kind of somewhat akin to like when you go to Dubai, like every other year, you're just like, oh my God, there's like, you know, 15 more buildings. Um, (laughs) It's the same sort of feeling. (laughs) In Miami, of course, I think the Miami's growth is probably a little bit more gradual and more organic, um, but that's a separate question. But so you can imagine in the 1960s that, you know, if I'm noticing these major changes even now, um, you can imagine what back then. And so as a civil engineer, you know, opportunity calls. um, And so he came down to South Florida and stayed uh, until his untimely death, unfortunately, um, about 13 years ago. I'm so sorry for that. So, 
Yeah. And just, you know, just last night, event at the Islamic School of Miami in a building that's actually named after my father um, and sort of paying tribute to his work, not just as a successful civil engineer who ran a design firm here and actually ended up constructing some pretty iconic um, aspects of Miami, um, but also his work in designing and helping to fund a number of mosques, not just throughout the nation, but specifically in South Florida. And his pet project was the Islamic School of Miami. Uh, and Majid Noor, which is connected to that. And so it was actually really cool yesterday just to be able, because I do talk about him in the book. I don't know if you saw that, Bervis, so far. I did. Um, but to kind of just this book event in a building that's named after him with the people who he worked with. Um, and it ended up really just being an event that was in tribute to him and his legacy. That, that's beautiful. And and I imagine sort of a, a part surreal, but also just a really fulfilling kind of experience to be able to do that. Yeah, just the fact that, I mean, the conversation kind of inspired more people to kind of come up to me and tell me their stories about my father. And what's been really interesting is uh, having moved away from Miami and, uh, you know, my in-laws live in Princeton, New Jersey, and I live in the D.C. area. And I have continued to just meet people that I had never met before who are like, we knew your dad and he helped us. He helped us um, buy our home. He helped us pay off our student loans, like just all these really wow. amazing ways that he improved people's lives. And so to hear more of those stories yesterday, I was like, I think I need to like sit down and really start to record some of these stories. Huh. You know, it's funny. Yeah. It's funny you say that. I mean, because I mean, one of the sort of impetus, of, you know, the impeti, I guess, or what is it? One of the impetus <laughs> for the show, uh, for the podcast that we do was actually to sort of capture these stories of, 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 of pioneering members of our community. Um, and, and as Zucky mentioned, sort of celebrating the American Muslim experience. And I think one can't do that but to recognize the sort of uh, shoulders of the people that we stand on, um, you know, today. So, um, and, and certainly um, your father, um, you know, ranks among them. And, and, and I think that um, that reflection, you know, as that, as that earlier generation slowly, but sadly begin to leave us, you know, and, and all we have is sort of their legacy and, and, and their, and, and the memories of course, and, but just the work that they've done and to continue on that legacy is, is certainly something that, you know, we hope to capture on this show. So I'm, I'm really actually, you know, um, glad that you brought that up and, and you kind of talked about that. Um, I mean, I, I think we'd be remiss not to at least mention your father's name. So my father's name is Tasneem Adin. And um, for those of your listeners who pick up a copy of my book and read and read it, um, he shows up in a couple of those chapters. And so you'll get a, just a glimpse of um, his tremendous story. That's right. Yeah. It's, you know, it's fascinating. Um, so actually, so, so um, Zucky and I are kind of related through marriage, as it were. Zucky's wife is my cousin. And it, it's interesting. Um, so she and I share a, a grand uncle, I guess it, it, it would be. Um, you know, he was the, the, the only... Um, you know, male child of like four among uh, of, of four siblings had and kind of came here in the late fifties. Apparently, um, I, I don't know a whole lot about him. I mean, he died when I was quite young, um, and and he settled actually in Miami. And I remember even as a young child, though, going and visiting that community and visiting like the mosque there. And at that, I mean, I couldn't even tell you which one I'm referring to, but it was just like a house, and it was basically outfitted and it was being utilized as a mosque. So I imagine just just sort of you know it just. Imagining in my mind seeing or or, or or what you're experiencing with your, in terms of the growth of the community in your in your hometown, um, but yeah, just a little fascinating sort of um, story of intersection there um, between I guess our story and and in yours. But uh, um, and then also I think um, there's the uh, Siddiqui family. I, I believe they're from Miami. Um, uh, Asad Siddiqui and others who you may or may not know. Um, oh yeah. I absolutely know them. I mean, Hamid Siddiqui was one of my dad's closest friends. Huh. Um, also the late Hamid Siddiqui. Hamid Siddiqui. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, late uh, Hamid Siddiqui, uh, father to Asad and Farah and Fawad and Sadaf um, and Imad, uh, who continue to be good friends of the family, of course. Um, and there was just, there were a number of these um, gentlemen who are essentially the pioneers of the community here. Um, Hamid uncle, um, my father, and a few others are actually written about in a book that came out a few years ago about um, the growth of um, Muslim communities in different parts of both Latin America and um, parts of the U.S. that are sort of impacted and have close connections with Latin America. And of course, Miami would be one of them. Huh. And um, these people are, are described as the quote unquote pioneers of the Muslim community down there. Um, 
you know, so my father and his roommate at the time um, were Masur Sayed. I don't know if you're familiar with the, with him. Um, yeah. So they had this apartment and both of them were Hafiz. Is they had the entire Quran memorized. And so the first ever Darwi prayer took place in their apartment. Um, and the first ever Darwi prayer in South Florida took place in their, in their apartment. And so, yeah, then they went on to really contribute in, in bigger ways to the community. Right. Uh, yeah, I know. Fascinating. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I guess then after growing up in, in, in Florida, um, did you, what was sort of law school, the first, uh, you know, sort of foray out, being a, out, out and beyond Florida for you or even undergrad? Yeah. No. So undergrad, uh, my parents wanted to keep me closer to home, um, right. which in retrospect, I think was a good idea. Uh, just I. Uh, yeah, as a parent now, with my eldest is twelve. I'm already kind of thinking about, you know, what college is. I mean, the sort of times in their life when they're most impressionable, and so I think, I think that was a good move um, on the part of my parents. I left for law school. I went to the University of Chicago and was there for three years, and then I came back, practiced here for about nine months before I got married and moved to Philadelphia, uh, where my husband uh, then had a startup. And uh, was there for about three and a half years, um, and then just kind of was done at that point <laughs> with uh, commercial litigation and corporate law generally, and decided I needed to kind of figure out which part of the law most read with me. And it didn't take a lot because it was pretty evident once I sort of looked, started looking through um, my both my educational career and even while I was doing corporate law, religion was consistently something that sort of animated me the most. And so at the time there was just only one a law firm, a nonprofit law firm that dealt with church state issues and did it from the perspective of religion being a good for society uh, as opposed to something that needs to be sort of kept out of the public space and did it on behalf of people of all religions as opposed to just kind of choosing your particular religion that you want to protect. And it was based in DC. And so um you know, my husband is has always been very supportive, including supporting moving out to DC uh, and shifting his own career. Huh. So yeah, so after three and a half years in Philadelphia, I moved to DC, and that and I continue to be there. I've been there since two thousand nine. Oh wow! Okay. And, uh, and so, um, and, and then I guess uh, I, you know, obviously, I, I think uh, people or, or listeners of the show may also be familiar with your work on with uh, Alt Muslim. Uh, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about that and sort of what the genesis of that was. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I myself, of course, am familiar with the site, but it, it is related or it is connected to Alt Muslim. It, or- it is so. In, so Alt Muslim um, came about in two thousand nine, actually on in March, 2009 on International Women's Day. Um, and it was a product of just a lot of thinking that um, that I, I and others have been sort of engaged in. Um, it, for me, it started in, in undergrad uh, when you know, 9-11 happened when I was in college. And it just, uh, from, and then the sort of the media are constant. I was already kind of having these questions about gender and gender equity in Islam, kind of really sort of wrestling with that. Again, kind of going back to my earlier point about um, the college years being highly impressionable and sort of tumultuous. And so that was a central aspect of the chaos that I was kind of feeling. And then I think that was made further acute by 9-11 and all the rhetoric that came afterwards with, the, for instance, the war in Af- Afghanistan um, and the way that it was very much justified with you know, this idea of the U.S. needing to save these subjugated women who were created at the hands of the Taliban, the story went. Um, and then in general, I think Islam and Muslims were thrust into the spotlight and there was so much of this sort of focus on the you know, so-called flaws of the Muslim community, a lot of it based on, again, the subjugation of women. And so it was just kind of a lot of just, I was already having these questions. I had a lot of questions just in terms of even what was going on on campus at the University of Miami, where we have, uh, at the University of Miami, we have probably an unusually large um, foreign Arab male contingency um, that, you know, had to, at least at the time, had in sort of influence on the way that the student Muslim community was organized <laughs> um, and sort of brought them their own kind of ideas of gender segregation and gender roles 
Um, and I, so kind I, of just I chuckle. observing. I, huh? Yeah, I, I chuckle a little just because, I mean, I think what you're describing um, could, could, you know, is, is the story of so many, uh, you know, uh, MSAs around the country and, and, and unfortunately campus life for, uh, for a lot of places. I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, it's just the reality of what it is. And so, um, okay, sorry, please. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I mean, that, you know, sort of uh, reflecting on my own experiences. Yeah, no, I yeah. Think- yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's that very aspect, right? That your experience kind of, that we're all sort of connected and that even though I am speaking about this very specific situation of the right. University of Miami, what I realized a couple years later um, was that, wait, there's like all these other people who were thinking, experiencing so much of what I experienced. And as I continued to learn about these, uh, I was like, what well, do I need to create a space for this to kind of be a, a national and possibly broader conversation and what better platform than the internet and in 2006 when i started um actually this was 2009 2009 when all of the thought process was going on much before that um you know when it when alt muslima launched it was the internet wasn't what it is now obviously uh, it was still a pretty new space and there wasn't at the time any other forum where this sort of conversation was happening and so it was it was a pr- pretty innovative. Um, it's called Alt Muslim because at the time Alt Muslim, which was founded or run by Shahid Amanla, as you know, um, was probably the go-to site for Muslim Americans and politics and just broader sort of social commentary. And um, I, at the time, wanted to focus on gender in Islam. And so I thought at the time, what I thought was a brilliant idea. I'm not so sure at this moment that it was brilliant. But I was like, oh, well, why don't we just add AH to all Muslims? And that will kind of indicate, you know, A, I get to sort of write off of his um, his established audience, which is quite large. Hmm. And also, um, you know, and then maybe the AH will tell people this has something to do with gender. Of course, later, the way people interpreted that was like, this is a site for women, this is a site for men. I'm like, why would there be gender segregation on the internet? Um, and that's totally not what it is. It's actually a space where men were writing as well. Um, and then later, I also, in, in the course of doing a lot of public speaking, realized that people just cannot pronounce, like non-Muslims can't really pronounce alt-Muslim. Mm. Um, so it has changed to alt-M. And... Oh, um, okay. Yeah, which of course the sort of very use of the word alt. I was about to say, well, yeah, I know. unfortunately, it's it's been, uh, uh, you know, the the there's a negative connotation now with that. Yeah, it's been appropriated by the dark recesses of of of, of, of society, let alone the internet. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, people are sort of attaching their own interpretation. That is so alt, true. Or, yeah, that is so true. Yeah, and, and and you know, worth mentioning. I mean, Shahid's been a you know past guest on the show, and so certainly someone uh, we've had on the show and had had the, had the uh, privilege of, uh, of of talking to. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remember just like you, like sort of again reflecting on that era of two thousand, you know, like the early two thousands or mid two thousands, um, and and just uh, going to alt Muslim and alt Muslim as sort of being the go to places to um, sort of read material uh, and, uh, and 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 be part of discussions that were taking place around these issues um sort of very um you know um you know really sort of you know talking about issues that were not only relevant but but really you know were were, were timely in, in in the sense of what the muslim community was going through so um yeah certainly made i think a very uh, contributing or played a very contributing role in in in, in allowing a space for, for for discussions and discourse to take place yeah you know i saw that impact with, you know, just an immediate launch of all to Muslim. I remember we got like, I think it was like 5,000 hits, like the day we launched, huh. which considering we had no actual like publicity, um, it was pretty, pretty surprising. And then soon afterwards, um, you know, was invited to just immediately started getting invites to, at the time there was a thing called the Muslim leaders of tomorrow program. Um, and you know, then I was just invited by the state department to go on like, to go on a speaking tour of like different countries and later on was invited to do a media training abroad. Um, and just like, it was just the, um, the attention was just so immediate, almost overwhelming. Like even the Washington post wanted a page um, that at the time was called alt Muslim at on faith. Cause we had a section called on faith. Um, but you know, it was on Washington post.com. And I think what to me, it was like the, the emails I was getting the articles I was getting the tension that the, was getting really kind of underscored for me the need had 
um, to just talk about these issues. It was like, we're all feeling it. We're all thinking it. Um, I think even just like the brief exchange between Burgess and I just a little while ago, it was just like, we all have experiences that connect to this in some way or other. And for a lot of Muslim women, um, and not just Muslim women, but I think mostly for Muslim women, um, it really kind of was uh, so central to their almost sort of like a, well, I, the same thing I experienced kind of like a spiritual crisis or like a true struggle with trying to figure out um, their relationship with Islam or their, or their Muslim community. Hmm. And so that was, that was amazing. Um, I think since then there's been a proliferation of other sites. I think alt Muslim continues to be pretty unique in that, you know, I feel like it straddles a sort of a space between um, a more sort of traditional conception of Islam, like a, a deep need for religiosity um, in the way we think of that traditionally um, and sort of the broader political discourse. You know, I think, Recently, people have been talking about this distinction as uh, Muslimness versus Islam. And I think a lot of the new sites kind of focus a lot on Muslimness. Um, but I try to keep a connection there to the extent possible between the religion and sort of our political identity. Well, I think that's, um, I mean, maybe intentionally or unintentionally so, um, I think that serves as a wonderful transition into talking about when Islam is not a religion, uh, both not only, I, I think, as an expression, but also uh, the name of your book. So um, I'd love to sort of delve into that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for that uh, sort of uh, stroll down memory lane for me uh, with regards to, I guess, where the internet was. I mean, you almost <laughs> look back to it and, <laughs> right, as, as the as the glory days or, or the days where you, you you tend to romanticize that period where it wasn't that uh, long ago it wasn't that long ago but 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 i feel like discourse has become so toxic uh, online and so i remember a time when it wasn't so and i think you know places like alt muslim and alt muslim and others um really were kind of forums where a, a time before russian trolls and uh, and just uh, calcified nastiness Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, thank you for that, Asma. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to kind of, yeah, delve into the book. Um, um, and I guess, I mean, you know, um, for, for anyone who's who's had an opportunity to um, read the book, I mean, I certainly recommend it. Uh, you know, it, it, it sort of picks up or the story picks up. Um, you know, in the days of the uh, Murfreesboro Mosque, and um, that in, in in and of itself sort of comes at the heels of um, the Park Fifty One sort of quote unquote mosque controversy in um, in uh, New York City. So the, the nine eleven mosque, right? <laughs> wasn't wasn't that the the narrative? Right? That's right, certainly. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to sort of talk about maybe like the genesis of why you why I, the, I know the Ground I, Zero Mosque, the Ground Zero Mosque. There you so, go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, kind of talk about I guess why you decided to pick up the book there, and and why I think what the events of Murfreesboro really serve as um, kind of an underpinning to the conversation that you have in the book. Yeah. So I. You know, I actually was involved in the case, um, not in the Chancery Court case, but in the, a parallel federal case that was brought after some of these arguments ensued there. And so to give your listeners kind of a, a brief background on that case, um, in 2010, as you noted, just in the sort of immediate aftermath of the Ground Zero Mosque fiasco in Manhattan, what a lot of people don't realize is that when that would kind of simmer down, it didn't mean that the controversy had by any means ended. In fact, it ignited a that has spawned anti-mosque um, opposition throughout the nation and continues to this day. Hmm. And so the first mosque to be affected was the Islamic Center in Murfreesboro at the time uh, seeking um, approval by the zoning commission to actually move forward with a construction it was a story of, you know, what I was talking about my father being a pioneer in the Muslim community and Burbeos was talking about his own story. And it's just in all of these places in, in the United States, there, there's there been the same sort of narrative, right, of, of people, a few Muslims move in, then there's um, these sort of small meetings that are happening in apartments um, or in sort of rented storefronts. And, and it kind of just grows, right? It, it goes from that to like a bigger space and it's just sort of kind of like um, ad hoc or kind of trying to find spaces that can accommodate these growing congregations. And finally it gets to a point where it's just like, there's so many of us and we need, and we've been doing this for so long, we need a permanent space. We need to build our own building. 
And that's exactly what happened in the Murfreesboro community. It just it was like moving from one spot to the next. Um, and it was just, it was time to build a mosque. And so they submitted the plan to the zoning commission to the county for approval. And they received approval. The approval just is sort of pro forma, the way it's done with all the houses of worship was published in the local news. They know that that publication, which mostly in other cases, in the cases of churches, for example, it just sort of ignored, um, ignited the sort of opposition. It's very passionate uh, in, in opposition that ended up resulting in a lawsuit. And these people brought this case um, in the locals or chancery court, and they argued in court over the course of multiple days, they put up these various witnesses on the stand and, and essentially put Islam on trial. Huh. And the argument was that unlike other houses of worship, this mosque does not have, should not have access to these different land use provisions that sort of help pave the way um, for houses of worship to be built um, because Islam is not a religion. It is instead a dangerous political ideology and um, and it poses security risk. Mosques are like Trojan horses that are being placed in American suburbs from which one day extremists will emerge to sort of enact the takeover of, of the U.S., um, and this was allowed to go on. I mean, there were some really, some really crazy vulgar questioning that was happening in the courtroom, stuff along the lines of, uh, um, you know, does a religion whose founder, you know, engaged in sexual acts with minor children, does that constitute an actual religion? Does the religion of subjugate women, is that a real religion? And these were being asked, uh, not just of people uh, like Frank Gaffney, who of course are responding in the, in the negative, um, but you know, other sort of county officials were sort of up there being like, what? Like, yeah. And they were just, this questioning was just allowed to, to go on. Um, and unfortunately, the court actually ruled against the mosque, but this again, this, this parallel federal court case, um, in which we brought a claim under the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, in that, in that case, the mosque prevailed and was allowed to be built. Um, but it continues to this day to face vandalism, people sort of um, spray painting the exterior or hanging bacon on the door handles and so on. And um, so, yeah, so I started the story there because the book kind of looks at this phenomenon of people, increasingly very prominent people, saying that Islam is not a religion for the very purpose of wanting to deprive American Muslims of religious freedom. And the place of this kind of really sort of come focus because of the literalness of it, um, hap- what was Murfreesboro? And so that's where I decided to uh, to start the book. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and, and you described the, the, the sort of six day, um, you know, hearing that take, you know, or the hearings that take place. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was you know, like the uh, plaintiff's counsel brings uh, these witnesses or these expert witnesses who are, you know, who, who, whose names, you know, like you mentioned, Frank Gaffney, but there's others that you get into in the book. I mean, it's sort of the veritable rogues gallery of Islamophobia, you know, in the in, in sort of the cottage industry or not so much cottage anymore, but the industry that has grown and spawned around it uh, of these so-called experts, right, who speak on Islam. Um, yeah, but they, they were sort of all trotted out as, as expert witnesses and like, you said, I mean, this line of questioning was allowed. And, you know, I, and I think it's also worth noting uh, the sort of own biases uh, of the, um, uh, uh, of, of, I guess, the judge, the magistrate to, to allow the, the, this kind of uh, circus really to, to, to take place. I mean, someone who I think, you know, traditionally himself was not one known to allow this kind of shenanigans in the court, but, but here, herein you, you sort of see, you know, those biases play out as well. Right. And it's something that I kind of flesh out in more detail later when I start talking about judicial biases more generally. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, one of the things about the book is that I felt, you know, kind of just the way there's a number of things that inspired it. Right. One kind of noticing the sort of uptrend uh, in the use of this, this, this language, um, especially kind of being sort of rooted in the religious freedom space where I'm advocating for people of every religion and then kind of seeing the selectivity in the way that that's being applied to Islam. Um, but also in the fact that, you know, there's these, you know, a lot of the existing literature on Islamophobia kind of looks at what these crazy media personalities are saying or what politicians are kind of are saying. And that's also relevant. But I'm like, well, what about the, the legal consequences, right? Like at the end of the day, like what the impact on our constitutional rights is like of such major importance, but no one's really kind of looking at that in, a way that's kind of coherent 
there and to kind of brings it all together. And more specifically, among all the constitutional rights, religious freedom, right? Because as a religious community, it seems to me we should be concerned about religious freedom. And, uh, you know, and so, that, so one of the things I do is the main sort of focus of this book for, for much of the, the book is kind of looking at these various legal ramifications argument. And what's interesting is that there have been a number of empirical studies done that kind of look at the range of cases, um, religious freedom cases brought by people of a wide variety of religions and have found consistently that Muslims are the least likely to prevail in their case. And, you know, so, and these various researchers have tried to figure out what, what exactly is happening here. They kind of try to come up with different arguments and theories, but ultimately what they come to conclude is that the reason the Muslims, Muslim religious liberty claimants in court are losing is because the judges, whether they even understand it or, or acknowledge it, are sort of um, have these inherent biases against Muslims as, for example, security threats to America. Huh. Um, and so they're not going to really want to vindicate a belief system that they think is essentially threatening to the very fabric of this country. Um, and so, yeah, so in terms of what, uh, you know, Judge Corlew in the Murfreesboro uh, context, what we can kind of begin to figure out piece together by the very fact that he allowed this inflammatory questioning to go on, unfortunately, is not isolated to the Murfreesboro context. That's right. And, 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 and yeah, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a very important point that, that, you know, we, 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 we tend to focus on these media figures or whatever and the politicians. Um, but, but all of that's not happening in a vacuum and that's certainly having an, mm. an, 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 an impact, a very human impact on, you know, people who uh, are at least, you know, um, in theory should remain unbiased and sort of approach, you know, a, a case or, or a plaintiff or a defendant that, that is brought before them, you know, in a way that is, that is free of those biases. But that's just, that's, that's just not the nature of how human beings operate. And so hmm. when, 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 when that kind of discourse is so saturated in society and so pervasive, um, you begin to see the real consequences of that. Right. And I think, you know, again, sort of another impetus in the book is like the fact that under the administration, a lot of people are really concerned about the hundreds of judges that are being appointed. Um, I do make it a point, I think in the book, which I hope is clear, um, that I'm somebody who thinks that but by, by if I judge or, by, or an individual being a conservative, a political conservative, that necessarily means that they're against our rights or that they're somebody that we need to be concerned about. Um, I do, the book is very much sort of structured, even in, as I call out particular people on the right, I do seek to sort of extend, um, you know, a fig leaf and, and say that, and, and, I, and I have worked with lots of conservatives. And so, but, so I kind of try to balance that. There's like this fear with the appointment of hundreds of conservative judges that some of these issues are going to be further exacerbated. And while I don't think that by, simply by nature of their being conservative, that that should be something that we should immediately be con concerned about. Um, but at the same time, I said a lot of these biases are made to be held by people on the right as opposed to. Yeah. I, I mean, the to me, it's it's less about them being conservative than about the sort of the people who are fast tracking their nominations. Yeah, I mean, right. So, so it's kind of like, what the, what's the agenda right. in the process? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the president is quite open. He talks in terms of his judges and Obama's judges, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, this entire presidency is sort of set up as a contrast to Obama. Um, and I mean, it's all strategic, understanding that you know, who is who is bases and their sort of deep seated um, huh. sort of opposition to a lot of things that the Obama administration did. So um, we're going to take a moment to actually recognize one of our sponsors, but 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 actually before we cut to that, I I did want to kind of you know again for, for our listeners who may not be familiar with I think even sort of some of the bases of 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 or, or of, of of a lot of which I think the conversation is taking place or or the conversation that you have in the book, um you know is 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 rooted in the First Amendment and 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 again. For those who may not read the Constitution or even be that as, as familiar with it, I mean, you know, you know the, the, there's a lot of conversations about the First Amendment, and we sort of laud and, and we hold the First Amendment as something that I mean, certainly is in, not only obviously enshrined in the Constitution, the rights uh, that are that are that are uh, that that come and and, and emanate from the uh, First Amendment, but that the First Amendment actually begins 
with a conversation around religious liberty and in, in particular, um, you know, uh, the Establishment Clause and the uh, Free Exercise Clause. So maybe, I mean, actually, before we sort of cut to you know, our, our sponsor, if, if you want to sort of, you know, again, maybe begin that conversation around, um, you know, what what are the, the religious liberties that are enshrined in the Constitution vis-a-vis -vis the First Amendment? Yeah, so as you noted, um, the two religion clauses, the free exercise clause and establishment clause, are the first ones to appear in the First Amendment. So the First Amendment lists freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press. And yet, very intentionally, the founders put the freedom of religion first. And the idea was essentially that if you don't have the ability to sort of believe in, to, to believe in your sort of the actual sort of deeply held beliefs that you that you have, and to be able to act on those beliefs, then pretty much all the other rights are irrelevant, right? It's just a, the, the sort of very foundational aspect of what it means to be human and what it is that motivates us and what, how, we, how we think of and connect to this deeper meaning and deeper purpose of our lives, that might be. And so it's, that it goes back to, you know, earlier I had said that, why is anyone talking about the impact on constitutional rights? Um, and more specifically, why aren't they talking about religious freedom? Because we as a religious community should be worried about religious freedom. Um, which strangely is not something that I think is actually like a part of our foundational understanding. Um, but, but also because it is the first freedom. It's called the first freedom because it comes first before the other freedoms and it comes first in the first amendment. Um, and so I'm just like, this is just so core. It's not even just core to who we are as Muslims, but it's core to who we are as humans. And so I think, you know, just being in that space and, and seeing this sort of huge gap in the divorce, um, parallel also to the fact that religious freedom as a constitutional principle is being trumpeted uh, very sort of loudly by the Trump administration in a number of different ways, um, but markedly in ways that are protected Muslims, um, hmm. or at least are not sort of articulated as ones that are meant to also protect Muslims are kind of all sort of framed as protecting other religious groups, uh, specifically conservative Christians. Um, you know, so there's like a number of different things here. It's just like, well, they get it. They've got all the good, the good language. They understand the importance of the right, but just the way that it's being talked about and the way that it's being advocated, unfortunately, is very skewed. Um, and so it was sort of just a desire to be like, look, this is a huge part of our national discourse. It's a huge part of who we are as humans and our human rights. And I think that there is a, a major lack of understanding of what the religious freedom actually means and how it works. Um, and so let me write kind of something that's a primer, um, both a primer on religious freedom, which chapter three, I hope serves that purpose, hmm. um, but also then connect it to bigger political discourse. Nice. Well, uh, with that, let me very briefly acknowledge our sponsor for this podcast, the American Muslim Fund. Founded in 2016, the American Muslim Fund is a grassroots national community foundation in the United States. Their focus is on creating donor-advised funds, giving circles, distributing grants, and building endowments for the Muslim community. American Muslim Fund is leading sacred, sustainable, and strategic Muslim philanthropy for today and future generations. Find out how your favorite nonprofit organization can take advantage of their services or learn how you or your business can partner with the AMF to handle your charitable giving at www.amuslimfund.org. Pervez? Yeah, thank you um, to our sponsor, uh, Muhi, and for the board for making all of that happen. Um, and of course, we are recording here at the Hub. Uh, and shout out to our man, Dre, behind uh, our, our engineer who makes all of the magic happen, but to the good folks at uh, Hub who uh, allow us to use the space. But uh, um, yeah, so uh, Asma, kind of sort of continuing uh, that kind of line of, 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 of the, the uh, conversation that we were having, um, you know, I, I think you... You highlighted, I mean, you know, like within the context of of religious liberty. I'm I'm wondering if you could also maybe sort of talk about, you know, traditionally speaking, how 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 have the courts, or have 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 there been conversations? Because if we're talking about quote unquote, you know, this 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 movement of you know, contextualizing Islam as being other than a religion, then, then you know, have there been conversation as to uh, conversations uh, at the Supreme Court level or, 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 or you know, or, or even sort of other federal or state level, um, you know, uh, courts uh, that, that discuss what constitutes a religion to begin with? Yeah, um, so that was 
an interesting part of when I was talking to people about writing this book and, and some of the responses I was getting that I continue to get is sort of like people think the book is about contesting the very concept of religious freedom or contesting the very sort of definition of religion as a sort of understood in the American context, sort of like, well, you understand that many of our sort of cultural understandings understandings of religion are very much shaped by a Protestant conception of religion right. and so on and so forth. And I'm like, well, that's all interesting. And I think that there are so many books that can honestly be written on sort of these other tertiary topics. Um, but I just needed to keep a focus on sort of the legal ramifications and that itself is so much there. And so as I know in the very beginning of my book, in the introduction, I'm like, there's all kinds of, you know, definitions of religion. And, and, I, and by the way, no matter which definition you look at, Islam qualifies as a religion. Um, <laughs> but I also, but the one I'm going to focus on is the legal definition. And so in that chapter three sort of primer that I have, mm -hmm. I do take a little bit of time to talk about some of the existing jurisprudence on um, what constitutes a religion. I know the Supreme Court hasn't really delved into that. The closest it's gotten is to look at um, is in the context of a couple of conscientious obje objection cases in, right. from t uh, against military service, um, and basically sort of you know determine whether or not the the beliefs in question there, even if they're not sort of traditionally religious, if they sort of occupy the ultimately the, the Supreme Court said they occupy the same space in the personal life as do traditional religious beliefs, and therefore they account um, for conscientious objection. That's the closest that the Supreme Court has gotten. Um, slower courts have delved into this question, try to come up with ways to define religion. Um, for the most part, courts tend to kind of just sort of <laughs> avoid the topic if they can, um, because there is one part of our free exercise principles is this idea that judges kind of need to stay in their lane, That's right. right? And so they don't really have confidence on the question of religious doctrine. And so part of our free exercise is to make sure that judges as state actors, right, as, as agents of the government um, stay out of determining which parts of our religion are valid in any way as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, and so the only inquiry they can really take, take part in is the sincerity inquiry. So if you say that this is your religious belief, if you say, for instance, like if you're a prisoner and you say that it's absolutely vital that I have Zabiha meat and all of my uh, meals that I have meat, and this is a core part of my religious practice. And yet for the past 10 years, you consistently have been eating non zabiha meat that raises questions about the purity of your claim, mm. right? Um, and the sincerity claim is most acute in cases, some of the cases that I talked about in the book, for instance, um, the Church of Marijuana cases. Uh, there's one called the Church of, I didn't get into the book, uh, into this in the book, but the Church of Body, body Modification. People who want um, exemptions from public school policies that say that you can't show up with body piercings, and they say that they belong to the Church of Body Modification. Um, and you know, the, the church of the flying spaghetti monster is another one. And so there's a couple that, that have really kind of strained the courts on questions of right. not just security, but it's actually just a pretext. Um, and so those I, are, I really love the, the I, th I think you quote, I think it's Noah Feldman who's like, is God a flying spaghetti monster? This is a, an actual legal question. Yeah. You know, it was great because I actually, after I wrote the entire manuscript, I went back, you know, I really wanted this to be something that was accessible to a general audience. I didn't want like boring academic subheadings. Um, and I was like, I had this idea. I was like, I'm going to use these, these news captions um, as my, uh, or these headlines as my subheadings. And right. which kind of serves both the purpose of being interesting, but also saying, look, everything I'm talking about is part of this bigger national conversation. It's a saga, right? And I'm taking hmm. you through the saga <laughs> and it's best exemplified by the fact that there's a headline for all of my sections, um, which to me was surprising because I hadn't scoped out these headlines um, before, you know, before I set out to come up with these subheadings. And so it was perfect. I was just like, oh my God, that's like the perfect subheading for like everything. And when, so when I saw <laughs> Noah Feldman, um, it was great. So, so yeah, so this kind of this definition of religion, it right. mostly takes place in the context of these really sort of bizarre cases. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and the cases that will not actually sort of enunciate the religions I think are actual religions have made clear, um, as I point out in the book that Islam is a religion. Um, of course, the nature of our jurisprudence is that it's constantly sort of changing. Um, it's impacted so much by 
what's going on in broader society. And so I don't think that just because things have been right in the past that we can kind of rest on our laurels. Huh. That's right. And I, I you know, I, I think it's also maybe uh, worth kind of discussing here or, or at this point, because we're, we are talking about sort of framing religion within a Protestant construct um, is, is the uh, 1993, I believe, um, Religious Freedoms uh, Restoration Act. So, which is, which is a piece of legislation that Congress passes, I think, overwhelmingly. I think there's only like three senators that, that, that voted um, uh, or, or opposed it or opposed the passing. And then it's signed into law by President Clinton. Uh, but, but maybe kind of talk about, well, you know, if these, law, if, if these, if these rights are enshrined in the Constitution, why even, ha- why even have something? Uh, why even have a, p- a piece of legislation like the Religious Freedoms Restorations Act? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, So the reason that that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was needed is because, you know, after this great sort of series of decisions under the Free Exercise Clause that interpreted it in this really broad way, um, there was one case, Employment Division v. Smith, where uh, Justice Scalia, of all people, sort of considered a conservative stalwart of the court, um, decided to severely restrict the scope of religious freedom protection under the free exercise clause of the constitution. Hmm. And it was this case involving Native American um, employees of a drug rehab center who had outside of work engaged in the ceremonial use of peyote, which which was a critical part of their Native American religious practice. And so it was considered that 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 behavior um, violated sort of the requirements of their job and they were fired and they're just like, well, this is part of our religious um, exercise. And so the language that kind of goes, so the court actually up, up holds the term termination, um, upholds the sort of um, the denial of unemployment benefits uh, on the basis of sort of termination cause. Um, and in it, he has this language where he's basically like, if we don't do this, then religious freedom is just going to kind of become this way for anybody who wants to you know, to sort of take advantage of the law and to be able to sort of use it in these problematic ways. And so he kind of like makes it seem like there's like going to be this major slippery slope if we don't do this. And he's like, I recognize the fact, of course, that, um, so he says that this needs to be done through legislation. And he that the protections that legislators are more likely to enact are going to be ones that the majority religion wants, um, because that's just the nature of how political power works, right? And so he's like, yeah, minority religions are totally not going to get the same protections, but well, that's just kind of a consequence of what this is. Hmm. Um, and there was a major outcry, like just from people across a political aisle, like what, like, how could you, you know, at the time, you know, many people, I think the, the bipartisan support there was just because there was this market to disadvantage for religious minorities. And that's so many right. people on the left were just like, you know, you've set up a, a constitutional framework that bears that, that, that puts the heaviest burden on minorities. Um, and so with, then there was a passage, there's a whole sort of series of things that happened. There was a passage of the federal religious freedom restoration act, which at the time um, was held to apply to the states. But then there was a lawsuit saying, well, you don't really have the authority. That. So there's a federal religious freedom restoration act. And this case, the kind of, which I don't really get into some of the parts of the story, um, you know, kind of try to keep it to the sort of more, most relevant parts um, in the book. But ultimately, through a series of litigation, it was determined that the states had to pass their own RIFRAs or Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Hmm. And what's interesting is that, so there's like not all the states have passed it. Um, so either the state has a, uh, a RIFRA or it tries to interpret that in its, through its state constitutional provisions um, or it doesn't have any of these protections at all. And what's, what's interesting is in the past few years, I don't know if you were following this, but there was, for instance, the Indiana uh, RIFRA that Indiana attempted to pass um, a couple yeah. of years ago. Right. There was this major outcry. Like it just sort of was like a national outcry. And it was like, we can't pass this RIFRA because RIFRA actually just paves the way for business owners to deny service to um, gay individuals. Um and it was just like, what? Like, at which point, you know, and it was just interesting. It's sort of the, the beginning signs of the depoliticization of religious freedom in our country today um, is the fact that something that was very much, you know, enacted in both at the federal level and in all the other states that have it as a way of protecting religious minorities uh, has now suddenly become sort of taken on this, this facade for many people um, as just being a way of 
using religion to discriminate. That's right, and then and then and of course, then I, I mean, I think we'd, we'd all it, it would also be worth talking about within this context. I mean, certainly of, of the Indiana um, uh, uh, referendum um, is is the case in Colorado, of course, that goes all the way to the Supreme Court about the about the baker, right, who refuses to um, bake cake, uh, you know, like bake a cake for a um, gay couple. Um, and, and so maybe kind of discuss where why you see that case as being you know really relevant within this context. Or, or, or certainly, you know, impactful for a, a, a religious minorities, um, you know, specifically, you know, a, a, as as Muslims. Yeah. So, I mean, so you're right to point out the masterpiece cake shop case. Masterpiece um, cake. Yeah, I was drawing a blank. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A masterpiece cake shop v. Um, the Colorado Human Rights Commission, um, and it was a case of the U.S. Supreme Court that was decided last summer, just a couple of weeks before the travel ban case. That's right. Was decided. Um, and in it, it was essentially saying that, um, it was a challenge against the the human rights commission having, uh, penalized this Christian baker who had refused to bake a custom wedding cake for a gay, a gay couple. And so it all that he was a fine with, and, and had always served, um, all people, you know, through others or products at his bakery and was also more than willing to sell, uh, one of his other sort of pre-made or sort of standard uh, wedding cakes, um, but it was specifically the request to engage, to to make a custom wedding cake that he declined because he said that this actual customization is my artistry. It's a it's a, it's my it's my engaging in freedom of expression, and I can't you know sort of create this cake because I feel because I my religious beliefs are against same sex marriage. My religious beliefs believe that marriage is limited to the marriage between one man and one woman. Um, which, by the way, in that very framing specifically is meant to also address polygamy. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, and so therefore I would be violating my religious beliefs to basically create a cake that in my various creation, artistic participation in would be a celebration of a marriage that my religion is against. And so there's a lot of this subtlety and people don't understand or maybe people kind of think it's just sort of semantics. Um, but that the sort of element of just sort of bringing his personal artistry and expression, which he thinks is is central to sort of like he he engaged in that act because it, and in the process of engaging that in that act is celebrating the marriage that this cake is for, right? And so that's the part of it that was really kind of the center of these cases. And I say cases because it's there was a masterpiece cake shop, but there's a series of other cases. Right. Um, there was one involving a wedding photographer, another one dealing with um, flower vendors wedding flower arrangements. And so in that scenario, um, the court held, and this wasn't just the conservatives, um, Elena Kagan also was part of um, this holding, that because the Colorado Commission had, it, there's a number of these commissioners when they decided to sort of find this um, this baker, they were essentially like engaging in really anti-religious and specifically anti-Christian um, language kind of like, you know, talking about all the different ways that religion has been the source of so much evil in the world um, and that his beliefs are kind of despicable uh, and they just really hate it when people sort of like bring up these types of religious beliefs. And they're just like, hey, commissioners, as government actors, the free extra, the, you know, the, the, our constitution mm-hmm. um, requires that you would not engage in these anti-religious statements. Um so, I mean, of course, there's a, there's the connection there three weeks later where the travel ban case was decided and the president's you sort of extended sort of litany of statements against Islam were held to be not relevant. So that's a separate discussion. Um, but with regard to RIFRA, uh, as we were talking about on uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, these types of cases are absolutely one of the reasons why a lot of people are concerned about religious freedom more broadly and more specifically the way that these statutes are going to, are going to be used. That's right. And, and, you know, and I think, I mean, now it's probably, I think it would be, it would be important and relevant to kind of talk about that travel ban because I, I, you know, the, the fact that um, the president's statements were not deemed relevant, um, you know, is I I think a very um, sort of, um, 
dangerous precedent in the sense that, I mean, you know, to, to the point that you're making with, with regards to biases within the judiciary, with regards to Islam and, 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 and Muslims that are brought before the courts um, is important because, again, much of those biases are informed by, you know, political figures like the president and others and, and, and the kind of pervasive language that is out there about Islam in the media and in the political space. So I think I think that becomes sort of a really da- a really dangerous precedent that I think Muslims or certainly or or, or or all religious minorities or all I think you know religious communities should be aware of. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And so I think that with the travel ban case, there there's a more nuance there than this question of sort of judicial bias, uh-huh. right? And and I Certainly. think and I think it's it's of course important to note that even if uh you know, I think some people look at a lot of people maybe uh, who are more conservative might look at these cases and the opinions and say, well, look, there's all these different ways that the, the court came to this conclusion. I don't think that that necessarily means that bias isn't at play, um, because I think that you can be biased, but still find perfectly legal <laughs> sort of means That's right. to uh, justify. Right. Um, and so I think that just sort of that the tendency to kind of think of that just because there are this is there is this other language is somehow that, that that there means there isn't any bias is kind of a kind of very sort of strange um oversight um but in the case of the travel ban so in terms of the explanations there are non bias based there is this question of separation of powers right and so there are per- certain parts of our law for instance that deal with national security foreign policy um and immigration that in which the executive branch just has outsized power, you know, and, and, and sort of, and the, the sort of nature of our separation of powers is that the judicial branch has to essentially defer to the executive because they just have the competence. This is another part of the, the uh, judge's understanding that they need to stay in their lane and sort of what their areas of competence is. And so it's been determined there are certain areas of the law that just, they just don't have the necessary, um, you know, knowledge and expertise to be able to second guess the executive. And that they're also, um, you know, sort of essential to a sense of sort of urgency um, to them, like again, national security in which the executive has to have the power and the ability to be able to act quickly. Um, and so all of those sorts of things were kind of came into play when the, the, the court decided to uphold the travel ban and said that the question of animus wasn't really relevant because it was like, mm-hmm. well, the animus would get us into the question of second guessing. Um, the executive. The um, and these, this is a traditionally an area in which we don't do that. Mm. Right now, what's interesting is I do note, um, much later in the book, and I have a, I have a chapter, chapter six, which deals with national security questions. It kind of looks at, kind of delves a little bit deeper into the way the national security is sometimes used a little bit too broadly to justify all kinds of really problematic government action. Right. Um, and there are, you know, legal scholars who are just like, we get it. National security is really important, but it can't just be this opening for the government to just do whatever it wants, right? There has to be some level of um, of sort of checks and balances. And so what's interesting in that context, I know that there was a series of sort of these former um, you know, security officials who filed an amicus brief and said, that, look, there is a protocol that goes into place before you have, you know, before you divorce of policies. And that protocol is completely missing in this case. And so they're just like, yeah, we get that there needs to be deference, uh, but there also is a process upon which that deference is tied, and that process was missing here. And so I think those sorts of things are the ones that, again, um, I think should have gotten a little bit more attention. Um, and specifically in the book, I call out, I mean, there's just so many different actors that could have spoken up, but of course I'm focusing on religious freedom. Right. Um, and so I just felt like there was a lot more space where religious liberty advocates could have stepped up um, and said more, even if they accepted the, the, the judge's decision that this was a question of separation of powers. Like I think there was a lot more sort of advocacy that could have um, come out that kind of showed that they were advocating a, a religious freedom that that is depoliticized, that is for one. You have to understand the public discourse. You have to understand the way that American Muslims and so many of their allies are understanding and interpreting this case. And you have to respond to that. I mean, it's so much a part of sort of maintaining the credibility of religious freedom in this country. And it's sorely lacking credibility right now. And so for advocates to sort of like leave that space open and to sort of be silent at a time when they could have stepped up is the bigger problem here 
than than even the the judge's decision. That's right, and I think yeah, and and you went exactly where I, where where I wanted to kind of take the conversation because I think it's important also to 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 mention or or to or to bring up something that you raise in the book, which is. You know, uh, the people, uh, advocates, right? People, you know, and, and whether those advocates are political, uh, you know, or in, in the, I'm sorry, advocates are in the political space or in the academic space, you know, these are advocates who, you know, there, there, there's almost been a shift in the conversation away from talking about this or contextualizing this or framing this within a, a religious liberty question and looking at it as, sort of a 14th Amendment or, you know, um, uh, yeah, uh, I- I issue. And I think there's a certain uh, danger in that approach as well. And I think I'd, I'd love for you to kind of talk about that and why kind of framing this beyond or outside of a religious liberty question becomes problematic. The, again, this idea of Islam not being a religion. Yeah, I mean, that's a really um, insightful question. And I don't, I don't actually remember if I got into that at all, but it was something that I was thinking about. Um, you know, because maybe I kind of read into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, but it's totally on point because the the interesting thing is early on in my research for this book, um, I read this law review articles. Law review articles are these like academic articles that are published in these legal journals. And so I read this article by a Muslim writer who uh or a Muslim legal scholar who um was essentially arguing what you just said. So she was like, Well, we need to stop focusing on using the free exercise clause to protect Muslims' interests, when instead we should be focusing on the equal protection clause. Equal, that's right. And her justification, among other, was that well, look, you know, we don't really prevail under the the free exercise clause, but also because we're kind of a racialized entity, and so we should be arguing this as more sort of like a, a uh, you know, a race based uh, discrimination. And I was just like, that is just so fundamentally problematic. Like that was my my first response to that, and it was just. And I think even though she might be one of a few people kind of talking more about the legal arguments that she that should be used, I think the broader, there's a much broader conversation about the racialization of Muslims that I think is very relevant. Um, and, 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 and a very real it thing. I mean, well. it's, not, it's not to deny that that, that that doesn't occur, but at the same time, right, the limitations yeah. of that or imagining it as that. Yeah, I mean, so, right. So it's like, we understand that there's these these broader dynamics in place. We need to we need to sort of acknowledge that because, as you said, it's very real. But then to then translate that as the types of arguments that we're using and saying that we're going to then define ourselves as as, as a racial group as opposed to a religious group in terms of the constitutional rights that we are owed. First of all, that plays right into the hands of people who are saying Islam is not a religion, right? Especially if you develop a legal advocacy that's essentially saying, well, we're actually a racial group, um, and. And therefore, I mean, because in order to make that claim, you would then have to like then argue that in your brief, right? Um, and that we are, our interests are better understood under a race-based uh, classification as opposed to a religious-based classification. Um, so it plays right into the hands. I think it's very sort of like, you know, not encompassing of the tremendous religious diversity, diversity within our community. Um, if you happen to be, for instance, a Bosnian Muslim American who doesn't wear a headscarf, that is pretty hard, I think, to make the case, uh, or and also doesn't have a recognizably Muslim name. Yeah, you know, you're still a Muslim. You're still accorded religious freedom rights as a Muslim. But I, I feel like it'd be pretty hard, for instance, to make a claim that discrimination against this person is a race-based classification, right? Right. Um, so you know, and then not to mention the the many other Americans who are who convert to Islam and who don't fit that phenotype. Um, I mean, what would be the advantage of trying to even frame it as a, as a, as a um, equal protection issue? I mean, because I mean, it's, again, sc- uh, strict scrutiny. And I know I'm getting a little legal here, but like it applies whether it's it's viewing this within a religious liberty context or or, or a uh, equal protection issue, correct? Right, and so I mean, so strict scrutiny under the free exercise clause again, because of Smith, is limited to certain categories. And by the way, there are Got a couple it. of pending. Um, cases sort of like seeking the court's review um, right now. I mean, I filed an amicus. I signed on to an amicus um, just this, like uh, earlier this week um, uh, in one of the cases that is seeking to overturn Smith. By the way, I had wanted to mention this before as well, that with the current um, sort of makeup of the court and suggestions by some of the conservative justices that they're interested in kind of looking at challenges to the viability of Smith, 
um, there is a possibility that the Smith ruling might be overruled and we might go back to a regime in which really robust religious freedom is protected under the free exercise cause. But as, but as I explained in the book, right now, there's sort of like this sort of carvings of where you might get that strict scrutiny. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I think from what I recall of this, this law review, it's been a while since I... I read it, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, her argument was going back to some, she was citing some of the statistics that I discussed earlier about the fact that Muslims don't win. I mean, they, they have a much lower win rate, um, when they bring the religious liberty claims. And so she's like, well, it's kind of hopeless anyway, so let's just look somewhere else. Um, and you know, and she just feels that that was just truer to what the Muslim experience was. Um, I mean, and so that, that, that those are her arguments in that case. Um, but like you but said, again, it, my yeah, you, like I think your take is it, it sort of creates this space then or this opening for, for, for the very sort of players that we're talking about who argue that Islam is not a religion to kind of come in, right? Yeah, and the other thing that, you know, I think that that discussion completely overlooks is the fact that religious freedom, this is something that I really try to bring, sort of emphasize, especially towards the conclusion of my book, is, look, religious freedom protects like a lot, like a lot, because I mean, it's like, if you just look at, I think Muslims tend to think of it as like our ability to wear a headscarf, our ability to build a house of worship, which I, as I discussed in the book, is even those sort of bread and butter aspects of religious freedom are being contested for Muslims. Um, but there's just like so much more in terms of just like the scope of our speech, um, the scope of sort of the nature of our objections to other, um, you know, I mean, a lot of people criticize Christians for wanting exemptions from, um, from other sort of laws, but the religious freedom does have a lot in there that protects the right to just be like, well, you know, the government is legislating X, Y, Z and many times trying to legislate a particular sort of ideal or legislate morality. And we have a different conception of what right and wrong is. And so should we, should we should have space to be able to, to live out our beliefs, right? Not to be coerced by the government um, in and other ways. And so within that, the there's hobby, just, like, so, I think of the Hobby Lobby case in that context. Right? Yeah. So the Hobby Lobby case is again, I mean, it is one that, um, that I actually worked on. Um, and oh. I talk about that in the book because right. I think that, um, yeah, so you will discover that in chapter eight. Um, that was actually, um, the Hobby Lobby was a client of my, uh, of the Beckett Fund. Um, and actually the entire discussion of RIFRA and the politicization of religious freedom and this anti-RIFRA wave actually was initiated, in my view, with Hobby Lobby ruling because the Hobby Lobby um, craft stores and the Green family specifically that owns it were, the justices ruled in their favor on the basis of RIFRA. Um, and hence, you know, started a series of measures um, that are now uh, seeking to be against RIFRA, including by the ACLU. The ACLU no longer supports the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in its current form. Huh. Um, but that's a whole, whole other long conversation. Um, and so yeah, I mean, so yeah, that is one very contentious example of the, the broadness of what religious freedom protects. Um, but there, you know, in the Muslim context, there's so much more, so much of our, you know, like there was a nation of Islam case that I filed an amicus in, uh, where it was a nation of Islam prisoner and he was being denied access to his religious literature because the prison system thought that this would be racially inflammatory and, and would then lead prisoners, other fellow prisoners to engage in violence, even though the same literature had been distributed in many other prison systems across the U S and had not resulted in violence, right? And so it could just be in the very simple aspect of like where the government has control over the speech and literature that we have access to and that we engage in, like you know, that is protected by religious freedom. And so if we don't protect this, and, and that is something that would be really hard to defend under the Equal Protection Clause, right? And so the breadth of protection that comes under religious freedom is inc incomparable. Um, again, because it has built into it freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Um, and so I think to just seed ground uh -huh, on that is just um, a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of an interesting point, and, and, and I think maybe this is a good place to, to, to kind of maybe start uh, uh, concluding the conversation is, you know, bringing him almost, or in a sense, kind of bringing it back to the conversation we were having earlier about, you know, the kind of conversations that happen on campuses around gender issues is, you know, again, from the vantage point of Muslim or from the vantage point as a Muslim, um, I don't think we do ourselves any favor 
um, certainly, you know, within the context that you're talking about, about those who argue uh, that Islam is not a religion, where we tend to feel that a Protestant imagination of religion, i.e. something that is private or personal or, um, you know, um, something that is, you know, uh, um, you know, certainly can occupy a public space, but, but isn't for sort of front and center, you know, sort of limits Islam and that Islam is more than a religion or that, or that Islam is more than just a, um, you know, a, a religion, quote unquote, as contextualized within a Protestant framework. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I would, I, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that like how we don't do ourselves any favor i think when we kind of frame or try to frame islam as being I, again i hate to say it but almost you know broader than a religion i.e an ideology as it were and and, and kind of feeding you know that or the, or how that narrative feeds directly into the hands of people who are who again are making this argument that it, that Islam should not allow or should not um, enjoy the you know the liberties uh, enshrined in the Constitution because it is not a religion alone. Right. So you know, and that is something that I explore briefly in, for example, the context of Chapter Seven, where I talk on a myriad of issues related to hijab, yeah, um, including my own experience with it and the way that the hijab has sort of become a political symbol almost right and so in the way that it's it's being used in interesting ways by political um, media and fashion industry uh, and the entertainment industry as well to sort of signal um, you know, inclusion and diversity but in, in terms that I think are very particular um, and authentic um, and so again that is uh, a much longer conversation but I think it goes back to that, as you said, the question of you know, versus Islam and the way that Muslim is now being kind of turned into this, you know, the, the discourse around it, which I think is, is, is a helpful, in many ways, discourse, kind of like to begin to figure out what are the different sort of strands of this, like the racialization of Muslims, and, you know, Islam as a, as a political identity or something that's sort of central to our political identity. Um, and also the sort of more traditional, you know, theological uh, idea of, of Islam as deen, which is a way of life, right. um, and then which is so much broader than some sort of narrow of religion. And I think, you know, coming from a perspective where I'm all about protecting the broadest form of expression, I'm not saying that people need to just stop saying those things, but I think that we need to be in the context of saying those things. We need to just be more aware of what the broader context is that we're speaking into. That's right. And the way that all of our speech is is just playing into certain into certain hands, right? So on the one hand, you know, it was interesting because I spoke at the, the prison mosque um, last month and the imam of the mosque was just like, he's like, when I first heard the title of, this was before I actually gave my talk, I just saw the title of my, my book. And he was just like, oh, I was just so excited when I saw the title of your book because I was thinking about writing a book called Islam is not a religion. Right. And I was just like, that like would celebrating be the worst it. title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, I know, I know what you're saying because I have grown up with that same idea. Of course. Of right. Of life. Right. But just because you and I get it, uh -huh. like you have to understand like, <laughs> that's playing into and again i only write about write a book that says that you know that islam is a way of life and so on but don't then also say that islam is not a religion hmm. um unless you know i mean in case unless there's some sort of like deep sort of wrestling with like definitions of religion and how our conceptions of religion are like you know protestant based i mean if there's like some really sort of academic theoretical sure, discussion sure you know i think that again there's a context that makes yeah. sense but for you to just kind of put a book out there and then to argue vigorously that it's not a religion, but it is something else, um, is like, again, you're just sort of playing into the hands of these other actors. So that there's there's that one element. Um, there's, again, as I sort of alluded to earlier, this 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 idea of the politicization of um, Islam, and specifically some of its symbolism. The hijab, I think, is probably the most prominent political symbol of Islam right now. Um, I think that there's a reason why... Um, you know, it's showing up everywhere. It's just showing up at Gap ads, Target, H and M. You know, um, in addition to the fact that a major Muslim market. I think we talked about into. this on a previous show, but like the like the latest Spider Man movie, right? Yeah, you have a character yeah. that is front and center, or, or not front and center, but but a character that's there and part of the group, and she is she she wears a hijab. Oh, oh yeah, it's it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, there's shows on. Um, 
like on Netflix, my kids are just watching some kid show. I think it was a cartoon actually. And there was a, a character in a headscarf or like, if you're just watching like TV shows, they'll be like, they sort of like these back. Yeah. As you notice, sort of like these, um, they're sort of the background crowd, right? right. Like some people are sitting in a restaurant, a person wearing a headscarf. Right. And I think that's cool. I think that type of inclusion is really good. Um, but I think that there are certain uses of it um, and some, and I feel like in many cases, we kind of see that with Representative Omar and the way that she was sort of championed by Democrats um, and the way that sort of her headscarf kind of says something about inclusion and diversity, but then time and again, sort of like her ability to actually speak authentically then from her own perspectives um, and not a sort of a, a pawn in terms of her bigger political scheme. And then she's been sort of challenged, right? So it's kind of like, it's useful to an extent. Can you just sort of like use it in the way that it sort of fits the the broader that's right agenda sorry the broader sort of ideas of what's acceptable um right for instance and, and, i talk about yeah the headscarf in certain tv shows has been used to kind of promote a particular type of intersectional um diversity so that you have muslim women headscarves who are engaging in you know extramarital extramarital affairs or they're um they're transgender or they're just like a melody like an external sort of appropriation of the, the sort of significance of the headscarf and the way that it's being championed in the public space, I think we need to be really wary of. Um, exactly. And I think so often a lot of Muslims are just like, headscarf, therefore awesome. And it's like, no, well, look at, the, look at the way that that's being manipulated and that other people are sort of, like I said, again, using that to sort of serve their own ends um, and are essentially in the process sort of changing the very narrative of what it means to be an American Muslim or Muslim more broadly. And I think that's something that we need to pay more attention to. I think it comes up, it has come up in, you know, I think we've seen sort of like even outside of proper sort of Hollywood appropriation, we see there was an outcry, for example, when a woman in a headscarf appeared for, I did an interview with Playboy, um, wrote about, um, I know that people have very different, sort of very wide difference of opinion. And I'm like, look, I, I love the celebration of Muslim women and Muslim women in headscarves, like I have been a beneficiary of being able to have spaces in the op-ed pages of, you know, major news um, publications. And, you know, I, and I'm sure part of that had to do with the fact that I'm a Muslim woman and they're seeking to create space for that. Um, and that's all just like really amazing. But there's certain lines that we just have to understand that just once you cross them, we're getting into a space where this isn't just about celebration, but it's really about this just changing the very sort of like narrative about our religiosity, right? That's and right. what Islam is as like a religion. And, and I felt that the line was crossed by trying to make what, what the interview was called, making a case for modesty. But you're making a case for modesty in the pages of Playboy. <laughs> very sort of, it, it's not just a publication, but it, it was a product of Hugh Hefner's very idea of what um, society should look like and the role of relig religion in that space. He thinks modesty and chastity and everything that's sort of traditionally valued by religion was a bad idea and that we should have sort of unlimited sexual freedom. Um, and so I'm just like, you know, I think we just need to think beyond. Again, you could be, and I sort of like in my mind had this distinction that, for instance, let's say it was an interview with this neurologist or this, you know, or this, this inventor or an astronomer. And she was like a woman who happened to be wearing a headscarf, but the entire interview was about like her astronomy or whatever, or like her major inventions. You know, that I just think that that's, substantively different from somebody saying I'm making a case for modesty huh. um, with this headscarf in the context of Playboy. And I'm just like the, that narrative and the very concept of modesty I, I, I felt was essentially being mocked in that context um, because clearly the publication doesn't share your views or anything near it um, or, or would be persuaded to that end. So so yeah, I, I just, you know, I call attention to it. The headline that I used there, once again, there's just like amazing headlines that were available to me as I went looking for them, right. was one from the Atlantic called America Need to Reject the Politics of Normalcy. And I just think that's like, that's exactly it. Well, there we go. Lots of topic areas that we covered and that uh, you cover in the book, which is when Islam is not a religion inside America's fight for religious freedom. So, uh, Asma, I know that you are uh, on the road uh, promoting the book. Uh, uh, what what are some of the places you'll be hitting? So, so far, I have done a number of things in D.C., in New York, Philadelphia, and in Miami. Um, I'm headed next to Austin. Oh, sorry, I'm actually headed back to D.C. Um, to do 
an event at the National Press Club, and then I'll be at the museum, um, and then I'll be in Texas Tribune Festival, uh, which is a big ideas festival. Um, I'll be actually starting, sharing the stage then with Omar Suleiman, um, so that'll be great. Um, but it's sharing the festival stage more broadly with people like George Will and Susan Rice, um, Ted Cruz, uh, Julian Castro and others. Um, and then I, there's just, uh, I'm going to, going to be going to, to Utah to meet with the leadership of the Mormon church. Um, I'll be all over Chicago for a number of things. I'll be at Salesforce, um, speaking at Faith Force, a Salesforce yeah. in Chicago, um, a bunch of other really exciting places. I think Farah is there, right? You, you might bump into Farah in Chicago, yeah. Salesforce, Chicago. There's yeah, TV. there we go. We talked about. It. That's right. And, That's uh, right. Yeah, exactly. And uh, well, uh, hopefully one of your, you know, one of your stops is California. And if it is, we'd love to uh, get you into the studio in person. Um, and, but uh, how about Isna? Is, is Isna one of the stops that you might be hitting? Oh yeah, I will be at Isna as well at um, the Meet Meet the, the Authors author, right. um, program, which is actually going to be the. Expo. Yeah, so it's good. we're going to be on the expo stage in the bazaar area. Uh, so I'll be speaking there on a couple of days, and then we'll be there available for book signing. Nice. Great. Well, people attending ISNA should definitely check that out. It's in my uh, one. It's in my old hometown of Houston. So definitely, um, you know, for those attending, but uh, also uh, to get an opportunity to meet with Usma and get your book signed, which I highly recommend. Uh, not only getting your book signed, but actually picking up a copy and reading it. I think it, it covers a lot of um, just really important conversations that I think are, um, you know, uh, that 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 are really important for the Muslim community to be having. Certainly within the context of. Of, um, not only where the Supreme Court is probably headed, but also just what we're seeing in you know in, in the sort of political space as well. But um, you know, thank you Asma for just really putting out I think a book that is um, you know that is you know engaging enough for the uh, a legal you know junkie like myself, but also accessible enough for someone who doesn't have to ha you know necessarily come from a legal background to understand all the concepts and, and the things that you are discussing. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, and thank you for this opportunity. And so, uh, as we often like to also ask, uh, in addition to where people can find you in person on your book tour, but also uh, maybe your um, if there's any sort of uh, media outlets or sorry, what you know, I guess online where people can engage. Social you. media. Thank you, social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have a website. It is asmauddin.com. A s m a u d d i n dot com. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I have both a personal page. Feel free to reach out. I also have now a professional page where I post updates. Um, and so, and I'm also on Instagram. Uh, but I think the website is probably the best place to kind of find the latest. Oh, you know, something that's been kind of on my mind that I wanted to ask you, and I think maybe this is, um, you know, as you sort of, as we uh, say goodbye to you, um, when you were at the University of Chicago, did you happen to overlap with a certain president of the United States who taught constitutional law? Yes, of course. Um, so he actually, at the time, was not teaching constitutional law. He did a Romar hallways, and he gave some very sort of um, enigmatic um, lunchtime talks, at which point I think people were already kind of like, this guy is just so charismatic. He's just sort of destined for something bigger. Um, but yes, he lived in Hyde Park. He roamed our hallways. Um, I have a deep regret that I actually ended up um, not taking his class on voting rights and instead taking a class on um, the Patriot Act. Unfortunately, John Yu uh, was visiting a visiting scholar. He was the, uh, the person who drafted the Patriot Act. I kind of just assumed that Obama as a the school would be around um, longer <laughs> beyond Yu's loss. Uh, but at that point, he decided to run for um, the U.S. Senate seat and ended up sort of leaving the law and, school. And no one heard from him that. again after that, after the Senate seat. Right? Yeah. <laughs> he disappeared into obscurity. But that is so funny. Right. Like you, 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 you. Unfortunately, you couldn't take his class, but you took a, you took a class with uh, uh, John Yu um, at, at Berkeley, right? He was a visiting. He was he was visiting um, um, uh, UC Law School. Yeah, so he was a visiting. So it was. I just sort of figured this is kind of like a temporary thing. Like, well, we hear from this one class. I should take his class. I think I'll take his class with Obama later. Um, but you know, he had other plans and that right. I wasn't aware of. So, yeah, but uh, I did actually study. Law with one of the best um, uh, religion, religion law with um, Philip Hamburger. Just want to throw that out there. He's a foremost scholar, one of the foremost scholars Absolutely. on religion law. 
it was amazing to be at Chicago and study with him. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is amazing. Um, so again, thank you so much, Asma, for taking the time and uh, wish you the best on the book tour and beyond and look forward to, um, you know, um, hopefully having you back on the show at some point. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And so Zaki, before we uh, say goodbye, where can people find us and engage us online and uh, engage you? I know you're w- way more active than I am on social media. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. You can also email us at diffuse congruence at gmail.com. You can also find me at my website, Zaki's corner.com. That's the A-K-I-S corner. That's also my Twitter. That's also my Instagram and Pervez. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, you can hit me up on uh, Pervez F. Ahmed, uh, as well as Facebook and um, uh, other. Um, yeah, so I'll, always available to uh, have a nice, insightful, and engaging conversation. So thank you so much for listening. And as always, we will see you the next time on Diffuse Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. Mm-hmm.